perceptions and our understanding what we, we you know you're changing when what you come in here with gets challenged if you're walking inside of this summit and you are doing a cakewalk you know and this is a very easy dance then we didn't we didn't th th there's not much happening and if you're walking through the summit and you're like checking off the box I got that knowledge I got that knowledge I'm about to go out there and change the world I am going to tell you the truth. It's been 22 years in this business. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> okay, and I'm 37. I'm very proud to be 38 in two weeks. Okay? It's not going to happen. So I just want to say that we are in, this is day two and day one and a half. And this now, I just want to, I'm going to introduce this panel. But I just want to say it's about to get really real. And at this time, do you remember, do you remember those group understandings? As you listen and engage in the next level of dialogue, I want you to make sure that you can at least touch somewhere, either in your mind or in your hand, on those group understandings. Because now that it's about to get real, real, we're going to need them group understandings. <laughs> One group understanding that I want to say, and this is not to shut you down. Actually, if you're... We, this is useless if we're shutting down. However, do not shut down. But I want us to, to um, acknowledge a thing called step up and step back. If you feel that you, 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 know, you know that you, you can express yourself and you felt a sense of place, um, you know what that feels like. There are some people who are not as quick to, to step up. Mm. So let's give other people that experience that you've been having. If you've been having an opportunity to really express yourself, um, step back a little bit and so that those who tend to not step up can experience what that feels like. If you are someone who is listening and waiting for someone to say what's on your heart, I want you to experience what it's like to put yourself out there. Don't wait. Step up. 
okay? So if we can <coughs> just employ that little bit of step up, step back, because this conversation is about to get real. And the, we're going to the pinnacle, and that's about to get real. And then I want to say something. Um, pace yourselves. Because you just pay, I don't even want to use trick patience. Pace. Think about pace. With that, I'd like to introduce this next plenary. This plenary is a plenary on successive leadership. And um, I want to introduce Martha Richard. She is the founder of Women Arts in San Francisco. <laughs> because they will tell their biography in the, uh, in the, in the session. Hannah Sharif is the Associate Artistic Director of Center Stage Theater. <laughs> Liz Diamond is the Director of the Directing Program at Yale School of Music. <laughs> Moderating the session, and we members of the steering committee will help to facilitate the Q and A. <coughs> Wonderful. Uh, all right, so I'm going to get over my stage fright, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, remember to breathe as we go through this. Uh, it's a tremendous honor and privilege to have this conversation with Martha and with Hannah. Um, we had a chance to brainstorm a bit last night about how we wanted to structure this, and I'll just share that with all of you uh, before we launch, and that is, um, uh, by way of getting to know one another, um, Martha and Hannah shared what I came to realize were their creation stories, mm -hmm. and they're so extraordinary, and so full of, I think, if you will, inspiration and lessons, uh, 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 and, and interest that um, that's how we're going to begin. Um, Martha, uh, who is moving toward uh, uh, the uh, next chapter in her life, <laughs> uh, which we hope will be full of pleasure and adventure, um, uh, is looking to create a succession for herself in the remarkable organization she's founded. Hannah, who has, as we've all, I think, had an opportunity to discover, um, is a rising leader in the American theater, um, whose time has surely come. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to hear about both of your journeys so far is, I think, going to be a great way to frame the conversation that follows. After that, I think we're going to talk about, I'm going to invite you both to talk about what are the challenges that you're facing. Martha, as a woman of a certain age, <coughs> trying to move into the next <laughs> chapter of her life, and Hannah, as a woman of color who is a leader, um, absolutely um, you know, ready to take the reins, uh, what are the challenges that you're facing as you approach the next chapter in your um, life? Um, and we'd like then to um, open it up to thoughts and questions with perhaps an, a, an idea or a, 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 as you listen, it would be great to have you begin to think about um, what, uh, what ways we could imagine uh, structures that would help these women and women who may find themselves in exactly these positions as they move forward in life um, to make those transitions easier and more creative uh, and, and less fraught with obstacles. Okay, so let's roll. Carol, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, tell us about yourself. Hang it on. No, so like, uh, I'm, my birthday is in, in December. I'm going to be 68, so 30 years on. <laughs> <laughs> a long time. <laughs> so when she asked me to tell my creation story, I, I, as I was thinking about it last night, there's really two factors I want to emphasize to you. My life has been about economics and it's been about identity politics and that that's what's really shaped the creation of women arts. And so I want to speak to you about that. So when I was, I started out, I graduated high school 67, the summer of love, <laughs> uh, and uh, the National Endowment for the Arts was created in 1966. Mm -hmm. And around that time, there were a bunch of different studies that were done talking about the arts and what we were going to do about the arts. The arts uh, had been sort of focused in just New York, or the theater world particularly. And there was this desire to spread it around the country. And, th and also, there had been, I, I actually was an economics major undergraduate, 
at Berkeley and did my senior thesis on a book by Bowen, William Bowen and Baumol about performing arts, the economic dilemma. Mm -hmm. And the thesis of that book was that uh, Hamlet took you know, X number of actors and three or four hours to produce it back when it was first written. And then all the rest of the economy had gotten much more automated. And so by the 60s, we were seeing that you know, everything, you know, car industry, everybody else, radio, television, there was ways to produce that reached much larger audiences with much less labor, but theater was still very labor intensive. So in the 60s, the late 60s, with the creation of the National Endowment, what the country was saying, what the federal government was saying was, gee, we need to preserve this art form. It's an important cultural tradition that we care about, and we can see from the economics of it, there's no way it's going to make it on its own. It must have government funding. It must have more support. We can't expect, if we're only going to have commercial theater, it's only going to be in New York, and the rest of the country will be bereft. So, so that was my, my senior thesis was about this book. And that attitude has shaped me throughout my career that, in fact, government funding is essential. The regional theater movement, a lot of the regional theaters started in that period. And it was because we had this idea we were going to be enlightened, we were going to be like Europe, we were going to support the arts in our country, and we were going to make the arts accessible to everyone. So it's kind of a sad state of affairs <laughs> when we're like, eh, it's all white upper class middle people, middle, upper middle class people that can afford to go anymore. That was not the original intention at all. Uh, and in fact, so one of the big inspirations in my career was Nancy Hanks, who was the second one to run the National, the National Endowment for the Arts started, had Roger Stevens. Then under the Nixon administration, Nancy Hanks was the chair of the National Endowment. She raised the budget from $8 million to $114 million. Under Nixon, mind you, a Republican, mm -hmm. Nixon played the violin, he loved classical music. And in fact, all of the major art institutions were supported by conservative Republicans. I mean, that's who had the money, that's who was supporting all this stuff. It made sense that it was a Republican cause. So you can see that that's completely flip-flopped yep. during my lifetime, which is really weird when you think about it. I mean, those donors are still the main donors in a lot of those the major institutions, but uh, for some reason we've gone, you know, so Nancy Hanks's approach, uh, because she was trying to get Congress to support the arts and get all the congressional leaders to vote for bigger budget allocations for the National Endowment for the Arts, and what she did was said, we want, we want this money to go to support your communities. So she persuaded the people in all the different states that the National Endowment for the Arts was a good idea by saying, because we're gonna fund your theater in, your, in, in Minnesota or in California or in Nebraska or wherever they were, you know, we're gonna support arts in your community because we believe in access for everyone to the arts. Mm -hmm. So that's been a big uh, theme in American arts management uh, that's been sort of lost in some ways. So, but that was, when I was starting my career, that was what the key thing was. So the other thing that was happening, so my first arts job, I actually went to, uh, so I did my undergraduate, then I went to law school, and then we can talk a little about the identity politics there, because at that point I was coming out as a lesbian, I was kind of a late boomer, but in my 20s I was coming out as a lesbian, and I was in San Francisco, and, uh, but it was clear that that was illegal. As part of my law school training, uh, in criminal law, they said, well, we have to go spend an evening driving around in a cop car. So we're driving around the car with me and a female mm -hmm. classmate, and the police turned to me and said, so, you know, you want us to go bust some faggots for you? What would be fun tonight? <laughs> you know, I, was like, no, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> but it was really clear. I mean, it was already clear to me. It was illegal that, like, when you wanted to be gay, you went to a gay bar, and, you know, with a lot of people with drinking problems because society was not accepting us at all. Um, so it makes me kind of dry to think about this. Mm -hmm. A lot of my friends who were teachers could not come out because they would lose their jobs. Uh, you know, it was a problem. Uh, and it was, you know, Stonewall had happened already when the police were making that question to me, but it was still clearly a problem. You know, I can remember going to bars and being afraid that the cops would come and bust the place because you could just lose your entire career if you got caught, you know, and arrested in that situation. So, uh, but also learning about the law, you kind of learn about ways you might, the civil rights movement had been moving forward, a lot of things had been illegal around other groups and we were kind of pushing those laws, the gay rights movement started. Uh, so I was kind of shaped quite a bit by that. I was also shaped a lot by the women's music uh, movement. The, there was a lot of, the, the second wave of feminism was happening in the 70s, and there was uh, these huge women's music concerts where it was mainly lesbian performers, and 
lots of lesbians in the audience, so you could talk to and hang out with, and it wasn't a bar, so it was very nice. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I immediately realized the value of culture as a way of transmitting values and bringing groups together. So, and I think that's also shaped me quite a bit, those early experiences of art that suddenly, like I, I love theater, I love going to the theater ever since I was a kid, but uh, there was always this slight disconnect that the stories on stage were not about me, mm -hmm. and when I was seeing the lesbian musicians and also singing about being in love with another woman, it was very moving and deep to me of like, oh, no, it's, it really makes a difference if the art is about you mm -hmm. or about your experience. So, so I, I finished law school, I got a fellowship to go to center stage in, in uh, well, I worked for three years in a small theater in San Francisco, uh, the 99 seat theater, and I sort of did everything. And then I got a fellowship from Theater Communications Group to go to center stage in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And I was under the wonderful Peter Cullman for a year. Uh, and Stan Wojewski, <laughs> uh, both Catholic, actually. Uh, but, uh, and, and that experience, it was, it was a great experience because I was learning about how theaters worked and all. And I was sharing this uh, story with Liz last night that uh, at one, you know, Peter was coaching me. And so he would say, you know, you got to learn to work the room better, Martha. You know, when you have a party with these donors, you got to learn to go shake all their hands and stuff and be outgoing. So I was working on that. And then at one point he had said, well, you really probably need some better clothes because I was still so <laughs> San Francisco. You know. So I went to the costume shop and had one of the women <laughs> And then he said, well, you know, you know, I have a budget for this costume. <laughs> Anyway, and so you I got Peter to pay for it. Well, yeah, I asked him to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> and you gotta talk, you gotta do the shaved your legs look. Yeah, yeah, that's later. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> spoiler alert. <Yeah. laughs> so Brooklyn College, uh, I, I go there. I, I, I got a job, Brooklyn Center for the Performing Arts at Brooklyn College. It's a big facility on a campus with four performance spaces, and so we did something like 300 shows a year. So it was a, produce, a producing show entity rather than a, no, a presenting uh, entity rather than a producing entity. So instead of you build the show and you put it on with your own team, it was you booked shows in and out constantly. And so that was a lot of fun also. So it was kind of like nine years of holding the phone like this while people scream at you with different accents in New York. <laughs> really, but at any rate, I was kind of moving my, I had started as a business manager and then at one point, one of the woman board members sort of took me and said, you know, you're really smart and I think you could really advance, but you really need to think about, you know, how you look a little bit more and, you know, how you dress. And I'd been sporting a necktie part of that time. <laughs> I was telling Schaefer, I'm kind of bookend to his story that, you know, I was sort of a butch lesbian, feminized myself in order to get the jobs. But uh, so they, uh, so I, uh, shortly after that conversation, I said, okay, I'm going to give up. I'm going to start wearing skirts and stuff. And, uh, and so I shaved my legs and I told Riz that like the next year I got promoted so my, sal my joke was that I started shaving my legs my salary went up 20 grand. <laughs> 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 so, that was, that was wild. <laughs> but anyway, so I continued at Brooklyn, you know, I started as the business manager at Brooklyn College so my line was that I worked up from being business manager up to executive director of Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn Center for the Arts at Brooklyn College and I was doing that for three years and then I was trying to get a regional theater job because I really loved theater and I wanted to get back into a producing organization. Mm -hmm. And so, and I was interviewing around and I was just sort of realizing it wasn't working. And I also, I weighed about 50 pounds more than I do now at that point. So I thought, well, you know, okay, I gotta, I've done everything else, I'm wearing the skirts, I'm trying, <laughs> you know. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna take a year. You know, my best friend also, given the identity politics, you know, my best gay friend from college was trying, dying from AIDS that year. Uh, and many of my friends died from AIDS during that period, actually. Mm -hmm. so, so I just thought, I have to be healthier. You know, so I lost 50 pounds. I spent one year uh, losing like a pound a week for a year. <coughs> and then I went out for job interviews, and then I, could get, and then I got the job mm -hmm. at Stage West. So I was running a regional theater. Uh, Stage West is in Springfield, Mass. It's a Lord C regional theater. Mm -hmm. uh, but then what happened was I had gotten a job, and I'm 50 pounds lighter, so nobody had known me as a fat person, nobody had really known me as a butch lesbian. And so I'm in this, and, and I was thinking, oh, you know, hooray, I can pass. And I was sort of like, yeah, because I expect to pass all the time now, mm -hmm. uh, which was really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> and the, uh, and the fundraising, you know, the thing I think for lesbians is very difficult, and if you are a lesbian, please feel free to come up and talk to me about this afterwards. But one of the challenges is, and I think it's actually a challenge for people of color as well, 
is the fundraising structure in a theater like that. You're expected to be, if you're the managing director, you're the lead fundraising person, you have to go to these events and talk to the straight pe people who have the money and try and get it out of them. And you have to be charming and you have to uh, work the room, as my friend Peter would say. Uh, you know, and it's, and that's, it's stressful because you're very conscious of the fact that you're completely, you're playing a role that's not you necessarily. And some of those, like everybody on the staff knew I was gay. I had a partner that lived with me, that I lived with. And, but it was, but with the donors, it's sort of like, they see what they want to see. You know, if you look like you're a straight person, they, they don't make any other assumptions. They don't think about it. They don't, you know, it's just weird. But you, so, but you, real, you realize that you're constantly editing what you tell them mm. or what you say about yourself. Mm. You know, and they're talking about their family or whatever, and you're really not talking about your family. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. is it time? time? I, no, I, let, I just want to give you just a heads up. Yeah, yeah keep going. Two, two minutes? Just a few more minutes. Okay, so, uh, so, we're, so at Stage West then, I was there for five years. I managed to bring the deficit down from 750,000 down, uh, accumulated debt down from 750 to 85,000. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I had done a good job. But I decided it just wasn't right for me anymore. I needed to go and I needed to start Women Arts, uh, which is the organization that I've now run since 1995. And it's, uh, Women Arts is, uh, the mission of it. I've been in the field then at that point for 20 years, and our mission is to increase the visibility and opportunities for women artists. And we started uh, as a, fund, a grant writing agency, basically. So for the first 10 years, all I did was write grant proposals for women artists. And I structured it so that I was getting money be, being paid by other people so that I could help women who were working independently. Because what, I, what you realize is, if you're in a big institution like Stage West or Brooklyn Center, there's staff all around you, the artists. Like the artistic director at Stage West would say he would have to pick the show and he would worry about the casting. But there was <coughs> other people doing the fundraising, doing the marketing, doing uh, all sorts of other tech stuff. Uh, once you step outside, there was all these women artists who were very, very talented, but they're expected to do everything themselves. They're expected to write the grand proposal. They're expected to write the press release. And if they can't do it, people are sort of say, oh, you know, well, they're just not realistic about their goals. They just want to spend their time doing their art. What's the matter with them? They should take a couple more grant writing classes or something and grow up. <laughs> you know, and it's ridiculous. You know, and you can see how from my background of believing in government funding for the arts, believing that artists needed to be supported in general, why I would start an organization that was dedicated to helping them raise more money. And, and maybe I'll leave it at that, and then we'll get, when I talk about the challenge, I can talk more about the arts development. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sharing. Um, I've had the, the fortune over the last couple of days of being able to talk to you more and I just am so honored by your journey and understand the pathway that you have paved for all of us who are younger than you coming up in the world. So my creation story, I think, uh, I think mirrors a lot of what many of us in this audience have been through. So uh, I, I recognize that my journey, though specifically I, I present in the body of an African-American woman who self-identifies a, a black woman in America, um, I think that the journey for me is very much um, emblematic of the journey of many women who are at, in my peer group. Um, so I, like, and actually listen to a show of hands, how many people started with their own scrappy theater company with their friends from college? Yeah. <laughs> wow, wow. Yes. So, so that's, that's, that's my story too. I went to Spelman College undergrad and actually what, what, what sparked it was we had this beloved head of department, her name was uh, Glenda Dickerson, and she actually, um, I, was, I was starting college uh, right after the Atlanta Olympics or during that time, she had led all of the uh, the Olympic opening, she was the director of that. She's this amazing, amazing artist. And she had an MFA. She was running the program. Um, and Spelman College decided that they actually wanted all of their head of departments to be PhDs. And even though an MFA is a terminal degree in our field, they wanted to up the numbers of head of departments that were PhDs. And so she, you know, basically made the decision that she didn't, she could go somewhere else, and she did. She went to University of Michigan to run their theater program. Um, and so we, found ourselves, those of us who were in the theater department who came to work under her tutelage uh, in this time of transition. 
And uh, to the extent that when I graduated from college, and I would just say Spelman was one of the best decisions I've ever made. I was a dual major, so I had another major that was quite stable and amazing. Um, <laughs> but when I graduated my senior year, there were no professors left in the department that had been there my freshman year, right? So if you're a theater major and you're learning, you have no one who's actually tracking your trajectory of growth. So during college, a group of us, including like Brandon Durden, some of you guys may know, um, uh, one of my dear friends, we kind of got together and we're like, how are we going to make sure that we're still getting what we need out of this collegiate experience and how are we going to create opportunities for ourselves and so we um, had a lot of brainstorming search sessions and we, we birthed a company called Nasir Productions and that was actually the beginning of my professional theater career. Um, I consider myself a multidisciplinary artist. I am a playwright, a director, and a producer. So I think of myself um, as a generative artist, an interpretive artist, and a curatorial artist. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that began when I was running that small theater company, right? Because we know that you end up wearing 15 hats. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. You're directing, you're writing grants, you're fundraising, you are, you know, sometimes doing light design, set design, mm -hmm. costume design. Um, we were still in the university when we started our company, so we did a lot of um, liberating materials. Um, <laughs> I, I remember our first show, we needed a really, really nice couch. <laughs> and we were uh, producing it in the Rockefeller building on campus, which is where the president's office was. And this is being live streamed. Many apologies to anyone. Uh, it's a long time ago. <laughs> but we would go in every evening after the cleaning crew had finished cleaning the president's office and borrow her couch. <laughs> bring it down four floors and put it on stage. We would do our show and then afterwards we'd make sure there was nothing on it and we'd take it back. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so that was the beginnings, and it was exciting, it was fun, we were doing the work we wanted, we were re-envisioning <coughs> classics, we were playing with form, we thought this is what we're going to do with the rest of our lives, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it was exhausting, and it was wonderful, and um, after five years of running that company, I had a vision of myself, and I said, you know what, I could do this for another 20 years, and we would probably be in a very similar place. I might grow the budget. Maybe we get to be one of those small theaters, $500,000, but I'd probably still be wearing 16 hats. And we're flying by the seat of our pants. We started this in undergrad. Like, there has to be like best practices that we don't know because we were just making it up as we went because no one told us we couldn't and we were young enough to believe that there's no reason why we can't do exactly what we want to do. Um, so then I was like, okay, well, I want to know how the people with multi-million dollar budgets do it. I actually want all of those best practices. I want to go in, I want to learn how they, what they do and how they do it and then I want to take it home. Um, and that's what made me move from my small company into regional theater. I went to grad school, got an MFA, and then I went in pursuit of best practices and excellence to take back to the theaters that were doing the kind of work that I believed in. And um, uh, I, I was in what I like to call a choose your own adventure grad program that was really incredible because it introduced me to some of the biggest mentors of my career and mentors in every section. So Edward Albee uh, uh, was my mentor in playwriting and a great gift in my life. So Peter Hall was my mentor in directing and um, and as I was leaving grad school and I was gonna go to the East Coast and I was like, oh, I'm gonna go and intern at the public, that's what I really wanna do. The head of my department said, well, while you're going to the East Coast, you should stop in at Hartford Stage. Michael Wilson was the artistic director there at the time. He used to be in Houston, which is where um, I went to grad school and where I'm from. And he said, just go talk to him. You know, I, I, I like him a lot, tell him, send, send, send my regards. And, um, so I went to Hartford to do an interview for their internship program. And the first person I met was a man named Christopher Baker, who at the time was the Associate Artistic Director. And we were supposed to have a 20 minute conversation. Our conversation lasted three and a half hours. <laughs> and then he introduced me to Michael and Michael and I had like a three hour conversation. And at that point I knew that that was my home and that if I was gonna learn, I wanted to work with these, these men. And so they were two of my first mentors within the Lort system. Um, and uh, I, I offer that Michael gave me one of the greatest gifts of my career. In my first year at Hartford Stage, he made me the liaison to every single department. So anyone who's working in a Lort Theater and you have the opportunity to bring up a young producer, I strongly recommend it. What that meant for me was that I was in every marketing meeting, every finance meeting, every education meeting, every development meeting, staff and board. My job then became to articulate to the artistic director 
the concerns and tensions of those departments mm -hmm. so that he had understanding of them. Mm -hmm. And then my other job was to be able to articulate back the singular artistic vision to each of those departments, mm -hmm. which gave me a facility with being able to speak to those departments in the language they understand. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different thing to talk to carpenters about the artistic mm -hmm. vision than it is to talk to the finance department or the oh, yeah. development department, but they're both essential. And so my first year, I started building that skill that's been, I think, one of the hallmarks of my career is the ability to move between all aspects of what we do and articulate vision and understand and reach for and nuance the concerns and tensions that could explode if they don't, if they aren't handled, right? Um, so I grew up in the business at Hartford Stage. I started as the artistic associate and 10 years later when I left the company, I was the associate artistic director and director of new play development. And it was an incredible time. It was hard, it was challenging. I was the only woman in my department. I was the only woman of color full time at the staff. And, um, you know, I always say that every five years I have a mini existential crisis where I go, what am I doing with my life? Is this what I'm supposed to be? Is this still enough in a community, in a society that's continuing to change? Is what I'm doing transformative enough? Because that's why I'm in this business. But at the 10 year mark there, I had probably the big existential crisis for myself. When I started at the company, I was in my 20s and I had this dream that I had been chasing. And 10 years later, I was in my 30s, and I had had my first child. And those of us who work in theater know that when you're in the thick of it, there's never enough time to breathe or to be really self-reflective about your life. You're in the process of doing and putting out fires, and there's very little time to actually take the me time to say, is the dream I had 10 years ago as a young 20-something still my dream? And I felt that for myself, it was incredibly important that I take the time. We had transitioned leadership. Michael had left. I stayed to help Darko Tresnik, whom I love, and is a great leader for Hartford Stage. I, I helped him transition in. And I was really clear. I need a moment to remember I'm an artist. Mm, yeah. Because while I was playing artistic associate and artistic producer and associate artistic director, one of the things I had to step away from for five years, when I, and I knew it when I went into the regional theater, was that I wasn't coming in as the freelance director that was hot out of New York that everyone wanted on their stage. I was coming in to learn and to master those tools and that craft, right? And so after a few years, I had to then start fighting my way institutionally back to the stage. I had to take, um, and this was a really big lesson for me, right? So when I started and you're that multidisciplinary artist and you're doing all those hats, no one tells you that you're only supposed to do one. Or that once you get into mainstream theater, that whatever their introduction to you is, is the box they put you in. Yes. And that it takes time and resources and a lot of ingenuity to break your way out of that box and to add another box. Yes. And so for me, it was, I'm a great producer. <coughs> Everyone recognized I'm a super producer. But don't forget that I'm a director and a playwright too. Mm -hmm. So how do I get you to see me if you've been introduced to me through the lens of producing to say, actually, I'm as great as those freelance directors that I'm in charge of hiring, mm -hmm. and that you should put me on the main stage too. Mm -hmm. And so that was part of my journey was to get my artistic director, who loved me, who supported me, who was a mentor to me, to see me outside of the lens of how I was most valuable to him in that moment, mm -hmm. in order to serve moving my career forward. Mm -hmm. And fortunately for me, I was able to do that before I left. But for me, I felt that I needed in that moment to get really clear about who I am, what is most important to me, how I was gonna move forward as an artist. And so I said, oh, I'm gonna take two years off, I'm gonna raise my daughter, I'm gonna write plays, I'm gonna be an artist, I'm gonna be free. My husband took a job in Boston, we moved from Hartford to Boston. The idea of not working for an institution lasted all of two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> because David Dower, who some of you know, Someone told him I moved to Boston. He had just moved to Boston. He called me. He said, little birdie told me you're in Boston. I said, yeah. He said, okay, come, come on out. I've got a job for you. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm not working for an institution. He's like, okay, yeah, great. Come on out. And, have a <laughs> and so at the end of the conversation, I had a, I had a gig um, at Arts Emerson, which was great fun. Um, but also because he did understand and respect where I was in my life, they gave me a lot of flexibility. So I was running a research program looking at barriers to inclusion within the African American community in the greater Boston area. And I was also um, uh, producing the residency, playwright residency program. We had uh, Daniel Beatty being introduced to the community. And so that was the job that I did during the time I was in Arts Emerson. 
One of the big surprises for me during that time, because I knew what freelance directing was, I had done it, I hired lots of freelance directors, but what I didn't know was that creative producing was actually a thing, that you could be freelance producing. And I didn't know until people started calling my phone. Women I met at smaller companies throughout the years at TCG heard I'd left Hartford and wanted to know what I was doing. They said, oh, I'm launching this program. You know, I, I don't know how to build my back office for it. Would you be willing to come in and consult with me? Um, there was a group called Progress Theater that I ended up doing a lot of work with who was rebuilding their ensemble. They were an ensemble-based company. Most of their ensemble had scattered. The company, the core company, wanted it to continue, but they needed to bring in new blood, and they needed to launch a tour, and they wanted to break into the regional market. So I came in and was a tour manager and a producer for them to help them rebuild and relaunch their company, which for me was incredibly gratifying during those two years, because remember, I never intended, when I first went into Lord Theater, to do 10 years. I intended to go in, grab the master's tools, and get out. And um, <laughs> this was an opportunity for me to actually leverage all the things I'd learned for the companies that represented the type of work that I had started out doing. Um, I did give myself time to do a little yoga and play with my daughter and also reevaluate and reassess what I wanted for myself in my career and where I felt that I could make the most impact. Um, we can talk a little bit later about this, but there were times when it was really hard in Hartford that I wanted to quit. Mm -hmm where being the only woman and the only black woman was hard. And every time I had those moments, my phone would start ringing and there would be playwrights going, you're the only one in the entire country in the position that you're in. And you're opening a lot of doors, not just at your theater, but you pick up the phone and you call McCarter, you pick up the phone and you call Arena, you pick up the phone and you call Longworth and you get us in those doors and if you leave, who will do that work for us? And I have to tell you, those calls are the reason I stayed and that I made it through 10 years in what at times was difficult. In addition to the fact that I was learning and growing and all that wonderful stuff, um, the fact that I felt very clear about the fact that if I left, they would not be hiring another person who looked like me necessarily, and that that advocacy that I was doing was bigger than me, that was part of what I needed to do for the field. And so at the end of my two years of, kind of self-reflection and evaluation and all the work that I was doing, I made the decision that it was still important to me to break through the glass ceiling and to become an artistic director of a major regional theater mm -hmm. and to continue the work of helping transform this industry, which is desperately in need of it, right? We know our audiences are dying. We know that our numbers are dropping. Theaters that used to be playing at 70% capacity are now paying, playing at 60 or 55 or 50, and God help you if you're below that, but there are some who are struggling to survive and that we haven't quite figured out how to reach those new audiences because we haven't filtered through all the new ideas. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole generation of women who, like me, have been number twos in helping build up other people's artistic visions for the last 15 years mm -hmm. who are ready and willing to take the reins. And so I said, okay, I gotta go back into Lort system mm -hmm. because that's still my goal. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the universe does what the universe does, which is as soon as I made that decision, my phone was <laughs> <started. laughs> And I had, was looking at two different job offers as associate artistic director at two large theaters. And then I got a call from a search agency saying, well, would you consider coming to Baltimore? Now, Baltimore is a $7.5 million theater. Hartford was an $8.5 million theater. It felt like a lateral move versus these other theaters were kind of twice the size. Mm -hmm. But as we know, when a search agency calls you, you pick up the phone, you say hello, and you have the conversation. <laughs> 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 because even if that's not the right job for you, they're probably going to be the people with the right job next time. So I picked up the call. Kwame also was a friend, someone whose work I deeply respected, and I thought I owed him the courtesy of like a conversation about the job. And the first conversation with Kwame was illuminating. He said, I want you to come help me transform this theater into a 21st century theater. This is a dynamic theater. It has a great history, but where we're trying to go is to be a thought leader among thought leaders. Mm -hmm. And I need and want you. And I said to him, I love that idea, and I believe that I can help you do that. Here are the things I want and need, yeah. right? So in Hartford, I was only, I was directing the main stage, and I love the work that I directed, but I was exclusively directing black work. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that if I wanted to be an artistic director of a major regional theater, I needed to diversify my directing resume. Mm -hmm. I needed to have classics, I needed to have large scale shows. I knew that I could do them, I'd done them in the past when I was running my own company. I wasn't the one who needed to be convinced. I just needed to make sure that I could make impact on that size stage with that type of work. Um, I had a young daughter 
and I needed to know that she could be at work with me at times. Mm -hmm. So my daughter has an office inside my office, and what Kwame mm -hmm. said to me in that first meeting was, your daughter can be at work every day with you. Mm -hmm. He's like, I don't do dogs, but I love children. <laughs> <laughs> So I tested it my first day at work. I pulled up with my car full of my stuff, and Kwame Koy Arma, the artistic director, came down, helped me unload my car, and carried my daughter up to the office as we started to put my office together. But I was really, really clear going in that if I was going back into the regional theater, I needed to make sure that I, in addition to being able to give all that I have to give and to leverage my talents and my resources to build out the vision of the theater, that the theater also needed to be feeding me in a way that allowed me to continue to move towards my dreams. And um, it's been exciting work I've done for the last four years in Baltimore. We have done incredible transformative work in our city. Uh, I am proud of it. It's been a great, great ride, and I'm excited about what the future holds, but I have deep concerns also about what it means to be a woman in this number two position in Trump America mm -hmm. during the most seismic leadership shift in our industry since the beginning of the regional theater movement. Mm -hmm. There are 21 open artistic directorships right now. Mm -hmm. By the time the dust settles in the next year or so, because we imagine that, let's say, at least half, probably, probably more than half, would be filled by people who are currently in executive leadership at other theaters, then those theaters will open up. Mm -hmm. So in the end, when the dust all clears, mm -hmm. if the women in my generation, our peer group, who, have, who are number twos all across the country, at the largest theaters in the country, are not able to break through that glass ceiling, I guess that moves into the second part of this thing, there's a question of what happens. Mm -hmm. There you go. You two are <laughs> unbelievable. You're extraordinary women. Um, I'd love to turn to the question that we talked about last night. Okay. Invite you, Martha. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll restate the question so that the room knows what it was. But as a woman of a certain age, um, uh, facing the next chapter, uh, what is your dream transition for your organization? Yeah. What are the challenges that you face as you move into this next okay. chapter? So I'm going like, to take a slight riff off of this by asking you all a question, which is, if you had $10 million, today to spend on gender parity and fixing the problem, what would you do with it? <laughs> and, if it and, and if you think about $10 million, I mean, she just said like one theater has a budget of seven and a half million. I mean, there's theaters that have budgets of 20 million or even 50 million for roundabout evidently. So you know, $10 million a year would not be an unreasonable amount to spend or $20 million a year to, to actually fix this problem because I feel like I've been running my little organization with one, you know, maybe we had three people, four staff people at the top, you know, and now it's kind of like me, <laughs> my computer. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're trying to solve a major societal problem here with little toothpicks. And I think mm -hmm. I want to encourage all of you to think much, much bigger about the problem mm -hmm. and what it's going to yeah. take to solve it. Mm -hmm. It's not, I, you know, I think each individual artist can try and get into the institutions and transform them a bit, but there is gonna still be the barrier of the funding structure. Mm -hmm. And you know, we need to be working on politics. We need to be working on uh, uh, yes. just the whole different ideas of how nonprofit boards might be structured. We need to change a lot of, we need to change the basic attitudes about women and what our stories are and that our stories are important, mm -hmm. uh, which might, that might imply uh, changing the educational system, starting with kindergarten and up through high school and college to make sure that women's literature is taught, that women's plays are taught. Because we know that the students come out of the graduate programs and they tend to produce the plays by the you know, stuff they were taught was important. So, you know, I think we need a whole movement, actually, to solve the problem, and I think it needs to be funded. If I look around the country at the other women's organizations, uh, working on gender parity, mm -hmm. hardly anybody is getting a full-time salary to address this issue. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, every time I speak, women come and say, oh, I really want to devote my life to this, I really want to work on this issue, but I have a family, I need to make money. Mm -hmm. and, and that's our key challenge, is how are we going to fix that? 
So my, you know, just to kind of continue on with women arts, we've done, uh, uh, and kind of get to my answer to that question a little bit. Uh, the um, one, one, one example I want to sh tell, share with you though is so, uh, there's kind of something called Prosperity Together. So it's a group of 29 women's foundations that got together and decided they wanted to address income, in, in, income insecurity for women <coughs> in poverty. And so they're going to devote $20 million a year for the next five years between all those foundations. But I think that that's the kind of model we've got to be thinking about is can you get a group of people together and we're going to like push forward on this issue and it's going to take a lot of us. It's not going to be one person doing it, I think. So with Women Arts, uh, we, we were doing the grant writing, as I was saying, and we kind of gradually <coughs> had to morph away from that because we couldn't get funding. <laughs> you know, you can kind of do everything for a few years, and then the foundation said, well, you know, you're still writing grant proposals for those women artists still, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> still important, yes, yeah, they still don't have the money. <laughs> <laughs> so we morphed for a while into sort of a web thing where we have all these newsletters and uh, women's, uh, Women Arts and Media Co Coalition in New York has now taken over our funding newsletters. Mm -hmm. When we did those for 10 years, we thought we would provide free uh, newsletters once a month that would give women all the funding deadlines and they would know about different opportunities coming up and you can still subscribe on their website. Yes. Uh, they, uh, and that we created a lot of other resources on our site and we've been kind of morphing into more of an advocacy group. But the one thing we did 10 years ago was create something called Support Women Artists Now Day. Because I decided the one thing that the world needed was <laughs> a holiday celebrating women artists. I've been watching, uh, <laughs> why not? <laughs> so so uh, we declared it. <laughs> it's now been celebrated by about 1,700 different events all in 36 countries. So uh, because of the wonders of the internet and so on. So, and the reason uh, I had started it was I had been watching Eve Ensler's model of V-Day. Mm -hmm. And the thing about that is that she started with like one performance but it became a fundraising tool for people where mm -hmm. organizations all over the world were doing these V-Day events and raising money for battered women's shelters or other kinds of groups fighting domestic violence. Mm -hmm. and, that, and it was raising like four or five million dollars a year from all these little events all over. And I was thinking that would be a great model for, for women artists because it's, you don't have to write a grant proposal off to somebody else, you're doing fundraising events. So it was, it was a very decentralized way of distributing the money. You know, and I thought, that's terrific. So, so we started this one day, and we haven't had as much success in terms of women doing fundraising events, but we have had events, you know, it, it's, it's a great community organizing tool, where in the towns where it's taken hold, which include Connecticut and Nairobi, <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's about 10 places around the world where there's swan things every year for the last 10 years, and it's become like a, a thing where the women who are involved, they network work with each other, especially women earlier in their careers or mid-career women who don't have an institutional job. They get together, they create other projects with each other because they've seen each other's work in a SWAN event. So to give you an example, the one in Connecticut is all about women musicians. It was a woman who had her own rock band and was very annoyed at the way she was treated whenever she came <laughs> to a, you know, an event. So she created an event that was all women rock stars, you know, or rock musicians that would perform together and do an evening of performances. In Nairobi, it's a very political event where they'll have uh, poets and singers and then a woman speaking about general mutilation or something. So it's a very much more politically engaged thing. That group is now in the process of trying to buy a little piece of land in the outskirts of Nairobi to set up a women's center. It's all because of the SWAN event. They created connections and trust among each other through their SWAN activities over the last 10 years. So getting back to my other question, what had, so also early on in, in Women Arts in the early 2000s, I raised an endowment. So we have like $480,000 endowment at this point, which kicks off about 20 grand a year. And then, then we also have some cash reserves. So I'm getting ready to retire and I'm trying to figure out how to pass Women Arts on. I'm not entirely sure it's viable as, I, I don't really think it's right to have it just be like a one, two person thing. It really, what I'd like to do is use that money that we have, our half million dollar endowment, our cash reserves, to launch something much bigger that we could somehow, get, and I'm hoping the women in this room are gonna take on this challenge, figure out how to do it. <laughs> like, like we need somebody with slightly different personality, like I'm really good with number crunching and stuff, as Peter noted early in my career, work in the room, be, you know, as a lesbian, as a whatever, you know, I need, we need people who really love doing fundraising to, to take on some of this challenge, and then a lot of the rest of us could be working on the mechanics of solving the problem of gender parity in this country, but I, I think that's what we need at this point, and that's what I want to try and figure out how to stimulate, and I haven't quite got the, 
you know, one, one thought I've been having that I've been talking to my board about is we could put out a request for proposals and people could put in their ideas. If, if you were going to run Swan Day, if you were going to try and build the next stage of this movement, how would you do it? And then maybe we give them a grant for 50 grand or something to try their ideas for a year. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about mm -hmm. for now. And like over the next two years, like I'll be 70 two years from now. And I'd kind of like to be done by then. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm happy. To, I'm sure I'm going to still be writing or carrying on, but uh, hopefully not running a nonprofit anymore. But uh, the uh, but that's my challenge to you, really. And it's sort of it's my my challenge, but it's my challenge to you is can we as a group or with all the other women in the country who are concerned about women artists work out how we're going to build a much, much larger organization to address the issue of gender parity and race parity because it's closely related. Yeah. So to get all of the challenges out on the floor, yes. let's Hannah, would you like to address the question? Um, sure. Well, let me start by saying I've had, again, great mentors in my career, but the overwhelming majority of the mentors have been men. And, um, and white men, at that, who've opened doors. And, you know, so I, I think you can find mentors anywhere. Uh, the greatest mentor of my career has actually been Amelia Cacciaparo. <laughs> I met her when I was very early in my in my time in the regional theater, um, and I got in the TCG New Gen grant, and that grant changed my life because it brought her into my life. And she has been uh, an angel, and I know that there are so many, I, I've never entered a circle in our business where I haven't brought her name up and had all of her other children <laughs> raise their hands and say, yes, me too. Um, but I, I, I cannot overstate the influence she has had on me and my journey in this business. And if, if for nothing else, then reminding me of my responsibility. Who is she? Amelia Hachapero is the head of artistic programming at TCG, the Theater Communications Group. Those, I know we have some TCG folks here who know that she is um, brilliant, one of the most fierce women I've ever met. And I've had the pleasure of traveling internationally with her and watching her take on what feels like the UN room at ITI. She is an indomitable spirit. Um, she cares passionately about our art form and about artists. And she has invested deeply in hundreds of us that are now leading in our field. And, um, and she's like my fairy godmother and I love her so much. Um, but I also recognize that she understood me and my challenges in a way that my male mentors didn't. Mm -hmm. And how important it is for anyone who's in any position, I don't care what your position is at the theater or the theaters that you work, work at, to think about how you're opening the door for more people who look like you to come in, mm -hmm. how you're helping them navigate these very difficult spaces. Because I had no one to teach me. I had to learn on my feet about how to navigate all of the keywords we use around what it means to be othered in this business. Um, and and I, so I feel a tremendous amount of responsibility. Um, uh, and I am constantly looking to hire dynamic women that I see potential in. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have all the skills. I have to believe that you there's something in you that's ready to explode. Because I can give you the brass tacks of how to move through space if you have the mind and the passion and the drive for it. And, uh, and so I, as we're talking about passing the baton, I just will say that in the capacity and to the extent that I can in the business, that is what I am committed to doing. Um, and I'm also, you know, but we know that fundamentally real change, real transformation comes from the key stakeholders and those who are in executive leadership. We've been through sessions this weekend, we've heard the numbers, right? It's tough out there for women. Those numbers get exponentially harder when you're talking about being a woman of color, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. There has never been, except one, woman of color who has been an artistic director of a Lort Theater in this country. There is one. And she's brilliant. And most people don't know she's a woman of color. Yeah. Right? There's never been a black woman to lead an, as an artistic director. And we're in this moment, we talked about the seismic shift in the field. And when I talk about my peers, you know, there are, different, there are different narratives that we hear. 
one of the narratives is, oh, we just don't know where to find. <laughs> right? There are no people of color in the pipeline. That is not true. Not just because I exist, but if we look at three of the largest theaters in our country, OSF, 40 plus million dollar budget, Denver Theater Center, 70 million dollar budget, the public theater, however many goo gobs or millions of dollars. <laughs> The number twos at all of those institutions, the, the women who are manifesting the vision of executive leadership at those institutions are women of color. So you cannot tell me that we're not qualified because we wouldn't be in the positions that we're in. Mm -hmm. You would not be leaning on our talents and our expertise mm -hmm. if we were not qualified. We do exist. And there are many, many other women who are in these positions around the country who are doing this work. But for some reason, we are not breaking through. We're not even fracturing the glass ceiling when it comes to executive leadership. There are no people of color in managing director positions at Lord Theaters in this country, right? With the exception of uh, Debbie Chen, who was uh, at, at Baltimore Center State. You're now at the Opera, so you're not in the alert system currently. But you're the first and only in the history of Lord. <laughs> Of, of managers coming out of these great grad programs who are associate managing directors and general managing directors. And I know that I'm here to talk about the art, but I just want to th throw a little lens on that managing director. I, I didn't fully understand. I went to a LERC conference a couple of years ago, and what, 80%, maybe more than that, of the managing directors were white men, but like 90% of the GMs were women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not yeah. a pipeline yeah. problem yeah. at all. Yeah. Because everyone qualified to lead is right there. You depend on yeah. them every day. Yeah. But they're not getting the looks for those executive leadership yeah. positions. And we're finding the same thing is true on the artistic end. There are a few more women that have made it through the glass <laughs> ceiling, but they're not women of color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's the question? What's the issue? I will say this. I've spent the last 16, 17 years of my life doing great work, I believe, in the American Regional Theater. We are in this seismic shift in leadership. If at the end of this shift, there are not more women, and significantly more women, and women of color that make it through that glass ceiling, what happens next? And I will tell you, now I'm gonna let you into a really private conversation. The conversation I'm having with my peers is, do we stay in this industry? Do we continue to leverage our skills for another 20 years, fulfilling someone else's artistic vision, or do we find a way to transition into a field that already has fractures in the ceiling and has the ability to recognize the excellence in what we bring to the table? I put that out there because I also think that those who are in the position to make these decisions need to think about what the American theater looks like if that generation of women who are in these secondary mm -hmm. leadership positions who are manifesting vision decide in mass mm -hmm. to leave the field. <laughs> what you got then? <laughs> take advantage of this extraordinary moment? What do we do if, if we don't bust through? And Martha's tantalizing, inviting invitation, <laughs> inviting invitation <laughs> to, uh, uh, for ideas for uh, uh, what to do next with this legacy that she's created. Let's hear from folks' comments and questions. And I'll try to be as rangy around the room as possible. <coughs> All right. Yes. 
Mark, then this is really just a logistical question. Are you are you thinking of women arts staying as women arts, or are you thinking of the money going and creating new things? They could create new things. I mean, like we're my, my board and I have been talking about, it and we're open to it. I actually think women arts is a great name, but you know, we could pass it to somebody else. We we trademarked it, but uh, <laughs> uh, so. Uh, but you know, the the point is, the endowment. We have to figure out where to put it. Uh, you know, it, one solution. If we can't find some women's groups to take it, you know, we we've thought about well, we could give it to another women's arts organization. We could give it. But you know, we want to find a stable place where we know people will be able to build it. I mean, it could also go as part of a college program or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some way, Swan Day would be a great experience for students if they we could figure out a way for students to take on helping the independent women artists who need fundraising advice or something. You know, so there's those kind of possibilities mm -hmm. as well. So no, we're not tied to it. It doesn't have to say in California. It doesn't have to. It just it's the idea and the the cash base. Julie. Yes. Oh, um, so one of the things I would uh, suggest is, uh, you know, we EDs, exec managing directors, get asked by recruiters, um, and there are executive recruiters in the room, um, who do you know? And, and for those in the secondary positions, you should get to find a way to talk to managing directors so they can recommend you. Um, because I get asked all the time, who's next? So um, that is a way to at least get the the pipeline opened up mm -hmm. in many ways, because recruiters only know the people at the top, right? Um, but we have to just penetrate a little bit deeper and network to managing directors uh, in your organizations or you know, pe people that are out of the organization, because recruiters kind of go and they sniff around for people that are not necessarily the usual suspects. So I would really suggest that we take that approach as a, as a way to kind of get the recruiter's attention. And there are executive recruiters here who I think need to be aware that they need to go deeper when they explore mm -hmm. prospects. Mm -hmm. Thank you, very helpful. Yeah. Um, I want to honor what Hannah just talked about and the um, thought of leaving this field. Um, and I, as somebody who's been in the field for 30 years, um, have spent a lot of this last year uh, wondering if my work matters. Mm -hmm. And if it has mattered. And, and not really believing that perhaps it does. I'll get back to that. But um, I think this is a moment for theater and for all of us to live in our discomfort when we're talking about intersectionality, when we're talking about privilege, when we're talking about cisgendered lenses that we're looking at the world through, and when we're looking at the lack of opportunity for our colleagues of color the, it's not a glass ceiling, it's the freaking bulletproof thing they put yeah. around the president's car, right? <laughs> you can't permeate it. So what are we doing? Because we all know how important theater is, but this weekend, as I've been talking to younger artists, they're often out. They're not even self-identifying as theater artists. They're like, I'm doing multimedia, I'm immersive, I'm doing other things, because we're not creating space. So I... You know, I think when you are a person who has the hair color I have, you have a secret power because you're invisible to the world. <laughs> and so I'm going yeah. to just walk right through walls and say, this is bullshit. And I think that's, we need to live with this discomfort right now and own it and not change that conversation that an amazingly talented, fabulous person is considering leaving this field. Right. And the loss that that's going to be. Right. And so that's our job, is to say, we can't let that happen if we really care about the field. Or we all need to call it something else. Because it is the magic sauce. We can create the change, and we are not doing it. So what are we doing? Martha, thank you so much for Swan Day, a play that I co-wrote with a female friend of mine um, just closed last night in Washington, D.C., and Swan Day was essential in my development process. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Um, I also want to say, and this is going to go on what you said about uh, change, and this is not to 
toot my own horn or anything like that. I hope that it gives some reassurance. But toot, girl. Toot. <laughs> yes, yes. But um, I started a theater company last year in the Washington, D.C. area to, as a direct response and to directly address the issues of gender disparity and racial disparity that we have in the American theater. Um, it's called Ally Theater Company, and I mean that in every sense of being an ally, that as the artistic director, um, I, um, my passion is opening up space and finding opportunity. I'm an extremely tenacious person. <laughs> um, and going out and finding the artist, um, developing them, bringing them to our stage, no matter how, whatever phase they are in in their career. If their voices have been unheard, I want to hear them. Um, and so we just finished our first season last night, and uh, it's terrifying and tremendous, but um, that is happening, and that's been my response to the problems that we are having in American theater. Yeah, Jordan. Um, so I want to say that I, first of all, could not understand and sympathize more why um, all of these bold and brilliant and innovative women would want to use their um, want to use their precious time on Earth to actually have an impact and not serve others' visions. Mm -hmm. But I also feel just this surge of anger because I want to say that this that this field was built upon a tax subsidy that came from all of our wages. Yeah. This field belongs to all of us, and they don't fucking get to have it. And so, <laughs> and so I feel like we are in this moment, and that was so beautifully articulated, I think leadership um, uh, that you show, and just your ability to, to um, describe where we are and what we are facing and what we need to go from here is incredible and shows that you have to get hired in one of these positions. But, um, <laughs> but we are in this pivotal moment, this seismic moment. What happens in the next 18 months is gonna shape the next 25 years in the field. Yes. It's gonna shape whether yes. or not we um, sustain patriarchy and white supremacy as our modus operandi, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and I feel like we have a lot of brain power and a lot of power power, actually, mm -hmm. in this room. And I think that we should continue to meet in some form, online, yes. virtually. I think we should engage, I think we should divide an intervention that ensures that we can't just, like the field can't just go by the status quo, right? <coughs> that we're making visible these invisible barriers and I don't know what it is and I think different, of, but like one idea could be, could we crowdsource all, uh, I've heard, I know every one of us have heard so many fucked up comments mm -hmm. that women leaders have gotten in these search processes, right? Mm -hmm. And there aren't that many search firms. And you know, it's interesting that the search firms that are here are actually not like the most commonly used ones, and I think that that speaks to something about the nature of the of the most common search form firms in the field of theater. So, could we crowdsource all of the comments that we've heard that that, that people have been told anonymously or whatever? Um, could we and could we create this massive list? And could we all? I don't know. Print it out on um, on like six foot pieces of paper and then gorilla like paste it on the windows of theaters around. Sorry, the I was actually <laughs> thinking maybe we should try and target the board members at the theaters, yeah. and, or maybe the managing director or whoever else is in place, and do a letter writing campaign or something. And yeah, say, well, I think it's yeah. really important to, yeah. you know. I, it occurs to me, and this may be something that the organizers and leaders of this conference, this summit, have in mind. But a summit is you know, a view from the mountaintop <laughs> of the world. It gives you a chance to creep, to have a global perspective on an abiding problem. And the problem that we're talking about at this summit is the problem of adequate opportunity for leadership for the extraordinary women who are making up this field and who are tired of waiting. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, whether, and this may not be the forum, it may be that this afternoon there'll be a forum for this, but it seems <coughs> to me that we should come out of this summit with an action mm -hmm. as a summit, and that that action could appropriately take the form, not of a campaign, but of a unified statement yeah. from this summit to the boards of directors of the major Lord theaters, to mm -hmm. the board yes. of directors of TCG, Lord, et cetera, uh, describing what we perceive to be the problem and uh, our, you know, the end of our patience with regard to taking action <laughs> for it. Yeah. Got it, hold on one second. I saw a hand here, and then pardon. we'll go to Shandri, who we only have two 
more opportunities for two more voices from the audience. Thank but you. Isabel. Let's spill the conversation into lunch. Yes. And remember, we're at we're at time. One here, one there. Yes. Um. So for the young women of color who are coming into these um, these spaces where people who are above us, uh, mentors, are talking about the struggles and challenges that they're having. It's kind of hard to continue to have that passion to be there and to be um, excited when I hear you say, maybe like I should leave this field. Um, and I want to hear from you all, what, how can these young women of color um, break break the mold of um, being put into the same boxes again and again and again? How can we, as, um, as peers, as a collective, um, break into um, the minds of executive directors, managing directors, boards, um, search forms, um, from your perspective? It's a very good question. I think that, you know, I. Here, here's what I'll say, even though I, I, I did the big, like, what happens if we all leave, I will say I'm incredibly passionate about mm -hmm. what we do. I wouldn't be here yeah. if I wasn't. I would not have been in this business this long, mm -hmm. investing as much as I have if I didn't believe in it. And even if I make the decision ultimately, you know, if, if, if we find that the, the end result of the next two years is the, the complete um, uh, re- What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Resupporting, yeah. reaffirmation of white supremacy and patriarchy. Um, I would not leave my heart or my work in supporting other artists who are still in the trenches. Mm -hmm. Right? I think that you have to determine, it's a question I ask myself all of the time, and I think every artist it is valuable to take the time to check back in with yourself, right? Because your answer one year may not be your answer four years from now, mm -hmm. right? Why are you in this business? Why do you make art? Why is this how you are choosing to serve humanity, right? And that's part of my own personal belief is that everyone is put on earth to serve humanity in some way and that this is the vehicle, theater is the vehicle that has allowed me to feel most liberated in that art and in that work of serving humanity. And so asking yourself, what are you in it for? Why are you doing this work? I think the entrepreneurial spirit that I see in young artists is absolutely inspiring. I think actually, when we talk about the future of the American theater, I think that America, the, the American, the structure of American theater has some big questions to ask itself about the future. Mm -hmm. the, some of it will be answered in the decision and the choices that are made. So if the, if the community at large responds with white men taking <laughs> 90% of the open positions over the next two years, then the message it's saying is that that industry as it currently stands is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Because oh, that's yeah. not what the world is, right? Yeah. The demographics mm -hmm. of the world yes. is shifting. So I look at a young artist like you and I say, okay, don't try and, don't try and get into that machine. What's the machine you're gonna create? Yeah. How do you guys begin to collaborate with each other? How do these small companies begin to pull resources mm -hmm. to create larger, more nationally impactful artistic experiences that begin to challenge and shift the financial streams? Mm -hmm. Because really the power of the structure is that all of the funding yeah. is isolated there. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to even get a conversation if you're a smaller theater with the big foundations that are actually doing the funding, right? Yeah, right? But if you start to collaborate together, if you start to pool resources, if you start to put on programs that move across the geography of the country and you're able to do something that has national impact, yeah. you can get their, their heads to turn. Mm -hmm. And if you can get access to them, you can get their money, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say that there are ways that you can think differently about the work and make sure that it's aligned to your, your mission and your focus and your passion while you're in the business. That's what I would say for young artists is that I'm waiting to hear, as someone who's been working within the machine, mm -hmm. whether the machine is willing to make space for me after I have mm -hmm. supported it mm -hmm. and invested mm -hmm. it and manifested its vision. Mm -hmm. yes. And that um, if you're not in that machine, you can take a look at what the answers are and make decisions for yourself about how you will take your passion, take your energy, take your art, and create something very, very new. 
It's as our responsibility yes, yes. to look at this problem and say, geez, we've got to solve it. We've got to help solve it. Women arts, over half of the artists that we've served have been women of color in terms of actual grant writing and, and funding. And it's because that was my decision, is that that's where the biggest need was, was to help get those voices forward. And so it's been a key element of my work uh, for the last 20 years. Here, in the center, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. I just want to thank you so much for creating space for this conversation. This is very important. Yes. We are a very important time. Um, I think, uh, Liz, I want to take kind of your idea with all of you, all of your ideas. And I think that, yes, we should not leave here without being committed to an action plan. But I think it needs to be bigger than a letter. I think it needs to be like, we will not go to your theaters. We are willing to stand with you because I'm like, if this wonderful woman right here, this is not um, an artistic director in the system that she dedicated her life to, I cannot, I will not stand by, sister, I will not and support the system. So I think that we have to be willing to say it is not just our responsibility as women of color is our responsibility as women, mm -hmm. as human beings, to say that we are not going to wait any longer. You know, we will not, and we need to think of an action plan at this summit, a beginning of what are we going to do to dismantle this system? We know what the system is. So how can we dismantle it so we can, we deserve to be able to work and have passion and to have a livelihood. That's, you know, we deserve it. It is owed to us because we are the theater makers, we are the leaders, so we, we cannot. So I just want us to all just start, I'm not saying we're gonna save the world, Kimmy, you already told us we're not. But <laughs> the thing is that we can start thinking about a action plan on what are we willing to do? What are we willing to give up? Because none of us would be sitting here if someone had not thought that for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm Thank done. you. I think feel that if we made a concerted effort to figure out, okay, where are all of these jobs? Who do we know on the boards of those organizations? Like Women Arts has a list of 12,000 people on our email list. We could send out and get people in every, you know, we have people in every state of the union. We could figure out, like, who do we know on those boards and let's write to them. There's women on those boards. There's a whole other movement that's the women's funding yeah. movement. Like, there's now women's right. foundations in basically every state. It's foundations mm. dedicated to women and girls. Could we get the board members of those women's foundations to support? Mm. And a lot of the time, those board members are also on their local theater boards because it's the wealthy people in town or whatever. Can we get the women's foundations to support the idea that we need, you know, there's other women's organizations we could turn to. I mean, it's <laughs> ironic that in Detroit this weekend, the people of the Women's March have a women's convention. They are not discussing culture or art at all. I mean, they're having yeah. a concert, yeah. and I think there's one yeah. person, but we need to make that bridge that we are part of that same movement yes. that they are. Yes. And, and I think we need a very targeted effort in terms of these particular theaters, just writing letters, calling people, going to the theater and talking to them about, talking to the boards, talking to the staff members about <coughs> the importance of this moment. I mean, I wish I could kind of bottle hand and send her around. <laughs> but, I mean, but we can get the message out of me. And it would have an impact. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Regarding action, so we're going to have some lunch and then we're going to come back in here for the final conversation and it's called the pinnacle conversation because as Liz said, we stand at the top, right? And we're looking out. Interestingly enough, it is a clarion call for advancement. In your program and throughout your working groups, you have been prompted to experience to, 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 to write your own personal manifestos. Um, I just want to encourage you to look at that over lunch, to look at your um, to take a look at the the, uh, the program and, and the template there, and to just imagine those three bullet points that you are um, determining for yourself. And there will be an activity during the la the last conversation 
um, for that. So I just want to um, ask you to not ignore that because that's an action that we're actually putting the call back on you. So with that, we're going to break for lunch. And then what we should do is do our very best to get in here at exactly 1.30 because it gets even realer. <laughs>